Well, hey, good morning. It's good to be gathered with you guys, both here in the room and online. It's great to be worshiping. I don't know about you, but this is one of my favorite parts of my week is whenever I get to gather with my church family and we get to proclaim the truth of the gospel together. Man, that song in Christ alone is one of my favorites because we get to remember that our hope is firmly rooted in Christ, that there's no guilt in life, no fear in death. There's something special about proclaiming the gospel together whenever we gather. There's something special about being able to see each other's faces. There's something special about being able to hear the word of God together as we respond. So man, I've been loving this series. I don't, I don't know uh, how it's impacted you, but I hope it's been really helpful. Uh, this, this series we're in is called Extraordinary Conversations. And it's all about equipping us as the saints, as the workers of ministry, to do the ministry that God has given us. As you hear us say at the end of every service, we've been the church gathered, now go help people follow Jesus. And that's what these tools are designed to help us to do. They're designed to help us be able to, to help other people follow Jesus. And in this, in this conversation, in this series about extraordinary conversations, we want to be ready because there are times whenever you're talking with somebody and something you thought was going to be just an ordinary everyday conversation takes an extraordinary turn. Whether that's an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody, whether it's a moment to be able to give some godly advice, to be able to talk them through forgiveness or to address sin in their lives, they, these are great tools to help us. And so today, I have the privilege of being able to talk about how we should deal with sin, both in our lives and in the lives of other people. And, and honestly, that's kind of a, a touchy subject. Whenever I say that, there's some of us in the room that just, just bristle a little bit because it feels very personal. It feels like something that's kind of taboo to talk about uh, sin in our lives and other people's. Um, but here's the deal. On our journey, we all struggle with sin. Look at this drawing from last week. So you remember this up and to the right? There's this section that, uh, that's right above that first cross that's got this, you know, the squiggly lines. And the reality is that as, as we are all on our journey of following Jesus, we've got these, these high points where we experience victory and where we're feeling good about life. And then we've got these low points where we're just struggling hard with sin. It's just the reality. It's part of our journey of sanctification. So as, you, as you've heard us say each week, we want to help you step in to closer relationship with Jesus and we want to help you reach out to help other people do the same. And dealing with sin is an important part of that process. So today we're going to look at a teaching from Jesus on some wrong ways and some right ways to think about sin in our lives and the lives of people around us. And then just like other weeks, we'll draw it out at the end. We'll draw out this tool. So if you would, both in the room and online, go ahead and grab your Bible, your Bible app, and turn with me to Luke 6. Now, as you're turning there, we're going to the Gospel of Luke. We actually were in the Gospel of Luke last week. There's a lot of great stuff that happens in the Gospel of Luke. The particular section we're jumping into is what we commonly call the Sermon on the Plain. Uh, it's parallel with the Sermon on the Mount that happens in Matthew. And in both Matthew and Luke, uh, this sermon is positioned directly after Jesus selects his disciples. And this is, this is such a neat story arc to watch unfold because Jesus has started his public ministry. He's gone to the temple and he said like, hey, I have come to proclaim liberty to the captives and sight to the blind and, and freedom. Um, and uh, Jesus has started making just this massive stir among people that people are starting to hear about him. He was baptized and now he's starting to do works and miracles and healings and stuff. So people are traveling from far and wide to check out what is going on with this Jesus guy. And so then this moment should feel very pivotal to us because there's been this revolution that's brewing and Jesus selects these 12 guys, these 12 disciples, and you can tell like something's getting ready to happen. And then he gets up uh, and he starts addressing his followers. And so this moment we should think about kind of as him saying, this is my platform. This is my campaign. This is what I am for. This is what I'm against. We're, we're kind of used to that in an election season. He's saying, this is what my platform is all about. And you, you got to understand that people in Jesus' day had two primary power sources in their life, two, two power systems and structures around them that they were familiar with. One was the Roman Empire that ruled by occupation. They ruled by military might. And the second was the religious elite 
that those Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes, the religious elite, they ruled by taking the moral high ground, by imposing rules on everybody else, by going around and telling people how life should be done, and by limiting people's access to God. And so whenever, uh, whenever Jesus is giving this sermon, everybody assumes that he's going to side with the religious elite against the Roman Empire, that they're going to finally band together and overthrow this military power. And that's what this revolution is going to look like. So whenever Jesus starts talking, it just blows people's minds because that's not at all what happens. Jesus tells them some, some mind-blowing things that actually like, go right against their religious elite. Uh, he says that his followers are going to lead by serving, that they're going to love their enemies, that they're going to rejoice in suffering, that they're going to be happy whenever they're persecuted. And he calls out the Pharisees really harshly on their hypocrisy and wickedness. So this is not at all what people expected. And this is what we're jumping right into the middle of. It's kind of Jesus' manifesto of what his kingdom is going to look like. So let's start by looking at verse 37. Jesus says, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. In our culture, we, we love this phrase, judge not. And whenever we say it, we often mean like, hey, there's never any reason that you should be talking about my sin. Like, don't you ever tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. You worry about you and I'll worry about me. And what happens is we take all these kinds of like ways of discerning right and wrong and being able to assess someone's actions and we throw them all into this bucket that we call judgment. And then we throw that whole bucket out the window. But that's actually not what Jesus is getting at right here. There's a specific way that he's talking about that you shouldn't judge. In fact, we actually see several times throughout this passage and throughout the rest of Scripture that Jesus says, this is how you're supposed to judge. There are times in Scripture that straight up says, hey, you're going to need to judge sin in this case. So Jesus is addressing a very particular kind of judging, and it's a kind that they saw all around them. In a word, it's this, condemning, condemning. And as we were studying this week, Pastor Matt shared that here, the word judge in Greek has a strong moral connotation. And it's not just toward the act, not just saying that what they did was wrong, but it's actually toward the person saying that they are wrong, that they are a bad person. And condemn adds to it the idea that not only are you judging this action, but you are the judge, the jury, the one, the one pronouncing the sentence on that person's life. And that's what Jesus is speaking out against, a kind of judging that is condemning. And the Pharisees loved to judge like this. They got kicks out of going around and telling people out on their infractions, the things that they were doing wrong, the things that they, they did against the law. And it made them feel righteous. It made them feel good about themselves. It made them feel like they had power over everyone else and they used it to oppress, which is terrible. But if we're honest... We've all done the same thing. We all get that way sometimes. John Calvin said it this way. He said, there is hardly any person who is not tickled with the desire of inquiring into other people's faults. For some reason, not only do we do it, but we kind of get a kick out of it. We like to look at other people and point our fingers and say, that's wrong and that's wrong and that's wrong. And we, we like it. It's kind of some, some kind of power trip. And I got to say, this is, this is something that's been a struggle for me in the past. It's sometimes still a struggle. Uh, so let me give you a peek into my story just a little bit. I grew up uh, homeschooled, which a lot of you, a lot of you parents uh, uh, throughout you know, this, this school year have gotten a little taste of that, what it's like to be with your kids all the time. And you can have a lot of sympathy for my mom who did that you know, 24 seven. Uh, my mom's name is Teresa and we called her Mother Teresa for a reason. She's just a saint of a woman. You can imagine having to put up with me all the time. And being, being homeschooled, I was sheltered a lot from the things that other kids did. I did, um, and I, that kind of lended itself to me feeling a little bit self-righteous at times um, because I didn't do the things that all the other kids did. And there were some good things that I did uh, that, that other kids didn't do. And so I would go to my church youth group, uh, which was the, the main group of kids I hung out with. And um, I made myself kind of the, the self-appointed morality police um, which, as you can imagine, made me super popular with my peers. Everybody <laughs> loves that whenever someone goes around pointing fingers at them. And so I remember uh, 
this coming to a head on a mission trip. We went to Louisiana right after Hurricane Katrina. And um, I was 14, 15, somewhere in there. And I was telling the other, the other team members with me, like I would point out their sins and say like, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing that. And there was a point toward the end of it where one girl had had enough and she slapped me in the face, <laughs> like just right across the face. And at the time I'm like, what in the world just happened? And now when I look back on it, I'm like, I kind of brought it on myself. I really did. I mean, she was not right for slapping me. She should not have done that. But I also understand where it came from. And so whenever Jesus says, don't judge, he's not saying you never can look at someone's actions and tell whether it's right or wrong. What he's saying is don't go around judging and condemning. Don't get tickled with the idea of calling other people's sins out. Don't do that. Don't judge in the way that they are doing it. The the Pharisees, what you've seen. And he says, instead, we should forgive and we will be forgiven. We should give and it will be given to us. Those two words, forgive and give, are so helpful when we think about how we deal with sin. So the word forgive first. This is an idea that doesn't seem very revolutionary to us in in 21st century America, Um, but it was a game changer in, you know, first century Middle East, because the law of the land at that point, um, what everybody kind of lived by was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which ironically is a rule that was given them by God, um, but God gave it to them to keep them from going too far in retribution. He was giving it to them saying, hey, you can't go further than taking someone's eye out whenever they take your eye out. An eye is as far as you can go. You can't go further than taking a tooth out whenever they take out your tooth. He was giving it to put limits on their sense of overzealous justice. But what they did was turn that into the law of the land. The final word whenever it comes to conflict resolution is that we have to make sure that always, and that whenever you take my eye, I take your eye. Whenever you take a tooth, I take your tooth. And so whenever Jesus comes on the scene and says, hey, you should forgive. It's just a mind-blowing moment for them because that's not the way they lived. Now in our culture, the idea of it is a lot easier to get our heads around. And we owe that largely to the influence of Christianity on Western civilization, whether you, whether you realize that or not. Um, though the idea is not revolutionary to us, the execution is definitely a little bit more elusive. It's a lot easier for us to say that we think it's a good virtue. It's a good idea for people to forgive. But it's a lot harder for us to approach others with a forgiveness first kind of attitude. And so what Jesus is saying is that whenever we deal with sin in each other's lives, we should come in a way that says, what I want most for you is not condemnation. What I want most for you is that you find forgiveness. And then he goes on to say that we should give. And this give isn't saying, isn't primarily about um, that we should put more money in the offering plate and those kinds of like financial generosity. What he's getting at here when he says give is that we should give a generous assessment of other people's lives. Because have you ever noticed how we, we have a tendency to think the best about our motives and think the worst about other people's? It's like whenever, whenever Joe walks in late to a meeting, we're like, man, Joe, that guy, he is selfish. He only cares about himself. He doesn't care about anybody else's, else's time. He just wasted how many corporate dollars by, by getting here late? That guy, he's just a lazy bum. When are we show up five minutes late for a meeting, we say, oh man, I got up and my, my coffee maker didn't work and the, the dog had an accident on the carpet and I left without my wallet and had to turn around and then I got caught in traffic. And oh man, I'm really, I would never be selfish in my heart. I would just, I just had a rough morning. We tend to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt, but we don't tend to do that with other people. So when our Jesus is talking about dealing with sin here, he's saying that we should do it in a way that is forgiving and a way that is generous, like giving a generous assessment, giving the benefit of the doubt to our brothers and sisters. And he goes on to say, what happens when are we do this? He says, judge not and you'll not be judged. Condemn not and you'll not be condemned. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. This is basically an extension of the golden rule that Jesus talked about back in verse 25. You've heard it. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Jesus is saying you wouldn't want someone to judge you harshly and condemningly. 
you would want them to offer forgiveness first and to give you the benefit of the doubt. And the cool thing is, in general, life works that way. Whenever you extend that to other people, that's what you receive in return. When we're kind and generous toward others, they're more inclined to be kind and generous toward us. So when we put all that together, we have our first principle of how Jesus followers are to deal with sin. And it's this. We deal with others' sins in the way we'd want them to deal with ours. Deal with others' sins in the way you'd want them to deal with yours. I mean, seriously, imagine a kingdom like this. Imagine a group of people who extend forgiveness first rather than dealing with each other or with condemnation. A group of people who said, hey, what I most want for you is that you receive forgiveness for your sins, not that you be condemned for them. Imagine how that would change your social media feed if people interacted in that way, if they were generous, if they gave others the benefit of the doubt, if they weren't condemning. Imagine how that would change your face-to-face -face interactions. That would be a game changer. Sounds pretty amazing. And the reality is, that's what the church is supposed to look like. This is the first place where we should be seeing Jesus' kingdom here on earth. We should be seeing a group of people who look like that, who deal with others in the way that they want to be dealt with. Let's move on to the next section. In verse 39, Jesus tells them a parable. It's a short parable. It's simple with a very simple point. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? Now we know right away that this is not going to turn out well whenever Jesus says this. It's not like one of those, I don't know, Jesus, is that a good idea for a blind guy to lead a blind guy? We know that this is a terrible idea. Whenever, whenever I was reading this, it reminded me of uh, some of my wife's experiences that she's told me about from whenever she was growing up. Um, you wouldn't know it by looking at my wife, Tia, but she grew up as a, a 4-H girl. So she grew up raising sheep and, and goats and there were miniature donkeys. I think there was a llama in the mix at one point and she just loved animals. She would go to the Massac County Youth Fair and she would participate by entering her, her goats and her sheep and stuff into contests and she won prizes for it and everything. And she told me, uh, oh, and I, I forgot, like one of the most, one of the most uh, disgusting things about it was they did a, a greased pig competition, which I've never participated in, but a greased pig competition, apparently you put a bunch of nasty grease on a pig and you turn it loose and everybody has to, to try to go ca capture it. And if you catch it, then you get a ribbon. And I realized this week that that prepared her really well for child rearing. The number of times we've gotten done with a meal and somebody's covered in just like mac and cheese getting away from you and you just have to wrestle them to the ground, it's, it was good practice for her. But she, she talked about this one event called Farm Follies, this one event called Farm Follies where they would, they would put out in a field, they'd put a golf cart and they'd put two people in it and the goal was to get from one side of the field to the other and there were obstacles out there, hay bales and, and barrels and all that kind of stuff and they would blindfold the driver and then the passenger had to give directions. They had to say, turn left, go ahead and stop, go, okay, you can go. And they were trying to get it done as quickly as possible. And I can just imagine the, the property damage, how many golf carts got totaled because of it. Um, now imagine, and this is what Jesus is getting at, imagine it wasn't just the driver who was blindfolded, but imagine both of them had a blindfold. It would be much worse, okay? It would be much worse. So much damage and destruction Blind leading the blind is a bad idea. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus frequently calls the Pharisees blind guides. And why does he call them that? He goes on to explain what he means by a person being blind. He says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you did not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your eye? You hypocrite. Now, once again, Jesus is describing this hyperbolic scene where he's saying, hey, picture this. You've got a guy who has a railroad tie in his eye, you know, eight feet long, you know, six inches, uh, six inches wide, and you're swinging it around and you notice that over here, your brother's got a speck of sawdust in his eye. And you're like, hey, hey, bud, let me help you with that. Let me, grabbing the visine, eye drops, putting them in and stuff. And he's saying, that, man, that's never, ever gonna work. That's never, ever going to work. It's a terrible idea. And we've all seen somebody behave this way. A funny example for me would be 
with my kids. This has happened often. If, if you've prayed with kids before meals, you've probably had it happen. Um, we bow our heads, close our eyes before the meal, and we pray. And as soon as we get done, you hear, Dad, Ellie had her eyes open while we were praying. And then you have to say, hey, bud, how do you know? Did you have your eyes open? Then realization hits and they're like, uh-huh, okay. That's a funny example, but uh, it's lighthearted. Jesus did not take this behavior of the Pharisees lightly. Jesus calls them and anyone behaving in the same way hypocrites, which literally means an actor. It's a word that describes someone who says one thing and does something entirely different, specifically someone who lays burdens of, of obedience on other people without any uh, in, intention to do it themselves. If I'm telling people that they are sinners without dealing with my own sin, I'm a blind guide. I'm a hypocrite. And we don't want that. Thankfully, Jesus goes on to offer us the right way to approach sin. He says, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. To paraphrase Jesus' point, he's saying it this way. Deal with your own sin first, and then help your brother. Now, it'd be so much easier to just condemn people without helping or to ignore their sin and just say, hey, I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to judge. You deal with your stuff. I'll deal with mine. But Jesus doesn't give that option. He says that we're supposed to deal with our own sin first and then help our brother. And that's hard work. And that begs the question, how should we deal with our sin and the answer for us and for our brother is the gospel. Remember our three circles drawing? In that first circle up at the top, we've got this creation that God made a beautiful world that had no sin in it, where we were in perfect relationship with him. It was flawless. But mankind sinned. And the Bible tells us that we are all born into sin and we choose to sin. And because of that, we find ourselves in this state of brokenness. We know that the world's not the way it should be. We're, we have broken relationships with one another. We have broken relationship with God. And we try to solve it in all of these, these little ways, those arrows that go out, whether that's power, control, approval, comfort. We think that one of those things is gonna satisfy us. Whenever God steps into our lives, he invites us to repent those X's over those arrows. He invites us to turn away from those things that we thought would satisfy us and to place our faith in Jesus Christ. And whenever we place our faith in Jesus, we're trusting in the fact that God loved us so much that he didn't leave us in a state of brokenness, but he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live perfectly the life that we were supposed to live, to die sacrificially on a cross, the death that we were supposed to die because of our sin, and to raise victoriously on the third day, showing that he had power over sin and death itself. And whenever we place our faith in Jesus, we start this journey of following him, that up and to the right, that squiggly line. And that line has these high points, it has these low points where we struggle with sin, where we're, we're having a hard time with life. But ultimately, Christ takes us into his new creation where we get to experience that ultimate restoration of all things, where everything sad comes untrue, where everything is made right. And so whenever we realize that, we recognize that man, all of our salvation is because of the grace of God. It's not because of something that we did. We have no right to brag about it. And when we realize that for ourselves, we're ready to present that to our brothers in a place of humility and sincerity, not in a place of power. That's what happens. That's the beautiful thing that happens when we deal with our own sin first before we deal with our brother's sins. The kingdom of God is to be made up of brothers and sisters who deal with their own sin first, then help one another. And it's messy. It often involves some, some late, late nights and a lot of tears, but we're all better for it whenever we do that. Then Jesus finishes up this section by describing the nature of sin. He says, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. Out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Now, once again, simple illustration to make a very profound point. Think of a good tree for a second. Think of a good tree. 
I think of like a peach tree because like you can just eat the peaches, you can cut them up with bananas and put some cream on them and sugar and it's delightful. You can make a peach cobbler with it. That's a good tree. Think of a bad tree. The first one that comes to mind for me is a gumball tree. How many of you guys have had a gumball tree at some point in your life? Yeah, how many of you guys liked it? Yeah, it's, it's not a great tree. I mean, it provides some shade, but it puts off those nasty little gumballs that you step on them with your feet and it hurts. You have to rake them up before you mow or it's gonna throw them everywhere. And it's just not a great tree to have in your yard. And what Jesus is saying here is really simple. He's saying, you'd have to be crazy to go out to your gumball tree expecting to find peaches on it. And in the same way, you're not gonna go out to your peach tree and find gumballs on it. He's given us a profound truth that in the same way that fruit reveals the tree, your actions reveal your heart. And we have a tendency to think otherwise. We tend to say stuff like, well, that came out of nowhere. You just caught me on a bad day. I'm not really like that. If you come back tomorrow, you'll see a better version of me. Man, that came out of nowhere. And Jesus is saying, don't fool yourselves. When you're dealing with sin, whether it's your own or others, it comes from a heart problem. And it's so important to realize this because when we try to deal with sin, we gravitate toward trying to modify or eliminate the fruit. It's like we go to that gumball tree and we just take some scissors and clip off all the gumballs. That's how we think we should deal with sin. We should modify the externals. We should deal with these actions, these fruits out here. And it it's puts you in a state of just being frantic and trying so hard and you end up exhausted because no matter how long you try to cut off the gumballs, it's still a gumball tree and they're gonna be back. They're gonna be back. If you don't deal with it at the root, it doesn't get rid of the fruit. As we were discussing this this week, Pastor Matt said, oh yeah, Nathan, we've seen that plenty in CR, Celebrate Recovery. We, what we see is that someone will address an alcohol addiction and then once they've dealt with it, they end up just having a spending problem and they rack up a bunch of credit card debt because they just filled that void with, with something else. Or somebody kicks smoking and then they end up gaining a bunch of weight because instead of smoking, they're just, they're just eating and they're not dealing with it at the heart level. So what Jesus is saying is you have to deal with it at the root. And that brings us to our third principle of dealing with sin. It's this, deal with the root, not just the fruit. Deal with the root, not just the fruit. Today, if you've not placed your faith in Jesus, if as I was describing those three circles, you say, man, I'm still in this place of, of brokenness. I need to repent and turn to Jesus. I gotta say, there's, there's no amount of hard work that's gonna transform the fruit. There's no amount of hard work that's gonna deal with that sin problem. Only turning away from self-reliance and placing your trust in Jesus can offer what you're longing for, what you, what you deeply want. Thankfully, God says in the book of Ezekiel, he says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, a heart that's soft toward God that he can speak to. If you're a believer, the reality is that we're on that up and to the right trajectory and we still struggle with sin. In fact, our battle with sin began when we placed our trust in Jesus. It didn't end. Before that, we didn't care to battle with sin. We're just dead in our sins. When we place our trust in Jesus, we're now simultaneously a sinner and a saint. And there's now a battle going on in our hearts. And so our battle with sin is ongoing. So our life as a believer involves regular examination of our fruit. It involves dealing with sin at a root level. Sometimes we can deal with that just us and God. A lot of times we need somebody else to help us process it, which brings us to our next tool that helps us in our extraordinary conversations about dealing with sin. So this tool is, is one we call fruit to root. It's a tool that's designed to help us identify what's going on deep down in our hearts when we're struggling with a particular sin. It's helpful for you to use on your own. It's helpful for you to invite somebody else to use with you. Go ahead and grab that, that little uh, piece of paper that you got on the way in and get a pen. Now, the first thing you're going to do whenever you are uh, addressing sin, wh whether it's in your heart or with somebody else, the first thing you want to do is you want to just invite the Holy Spirit into the process because the Bible tells us that the human heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? 
So we, we can't even often tell what's going on in our own hearts apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. We invite the Spirit to work, and then we go to work. I'm going to draw this out. Go ahead and draw with me. I will forewarn you that I'm, one, uh, I, I'm not a good artist. Um, Michael looks like, um, uh, he looks like an artist. I was trying to think of a famous artist, but it just escaped me. So Michael looks like an artist compared to me. <laughs> okay, so draw up here some, the top part of a tree, okay? You're going to draw some fruit on it right there. This represents your actions, Write the word actions. Now draw the trunk of the tree. This represents your mind, what's going on in your thoughts and your feelings. Now draw some roots. I'm going to ask you to draw four roots that have some space to write words on them, just like this. This represents what's going on in your heart. And the heart is the place that you, that you worship. It's the place that you say what's ultimately deserving of your time and attention. It's the place that you um, decide what you think is going to give you ultimate satisfaction. And down here at this, at this heart level, we're going to write four words. Um, because there, there's been, uh, theologians have posited that there are like four root idols is what they call them, things that we turn to that can sum up all of the forms of sin that result in all these forms of, of sinful actions. And I found it to be very helpful. Those four are power. That's a longing for um, influence or recognition. Control. That's a desire to have everything go according to your plan. Approval. That's the desire to be liked and accepted. And then you've got comfort. That's a longing for pleasure. And as I've tried this, as I've tried these four on, I found it to be very helpful for me in thinking through like the places uh, that, that I turn. Um, so now, how do we actually use this tool? Whenever you are dealing with a, a sin struggle, I mean, I would, I would do what Jesus said. I would, I would say, deal with your own sin first before you deal with somebody else's. This can be so helpful um, to assess like, okay, asking the first question up at the top. Man, what is it that I experienced? What is it that I did? What was the behavior or the attitude that gave me a problem? And then moving on down to the mind, you're saying, okay, what was I thinking and feeling whenever that happened? And often that reveals to us what's going on down in our heart. So let me just give you an example. Um, as I was praying about this this week, uh, God was bringing some stuff to mind for me, just, just very vulnerably. These are some struggles that I've had. Um, so a lot of times whenever I get home from work, I have, I have four kids. My wife stays at home with the kids. And whenever I've gotten home from work, I've had a tendency to want to just retreat, whether it's go into the bedroom or go sit in my recliner and I'm just going to pull up my phone and scroll some social media for a little bit. And what that's doing is leaving my wife to the work of discipling our kids and raising them. She's finishing up dinner. She's trying to care with them. They're fussy. And I'm saying, like, I need to go over here uh, and just have some me time. And so that's the action. What's going on in my heart is, man, I deserve this. I deserve this. I've had a hard day at work. I need some time just to, to pamper myself and be alone for a little bit. That's the hearts, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, that's the thoughts and feelings that are going on in my head. And what that gets down to for me is just a desire for comfort. Desire for comfort. I just want to be pleasured. I want to uh, ignore my responsibilities and just experience pleasure for a little bit. Or another one that I've had a hard time with um, is whenever I do something that I'm proud of, I want to brag about it. I want to make sure that people notice. I want to make sure that they, they saw what I did. And what's going on in my head at that point is that I'm feeling underappreciated. Um, I'm feeling like, man, they need to know that I'm smart and hardworking. And so I just toss it out there like, hey, I did this this week. And that comes from a longing for approval. I want people to think that I'm like, that I'm something special. Okay. That's just a couple examples from my heart. And so then whenever you identify that issue, that's, that's half the battle, like getting down to it. But we also know that like just knowing it doesn't transform us. 
there's a process that happens from there where we build it back up. We go up the other side of the tree. If you've been working down this side of the tree to get down to the heart issue, now we're going to deal with the heart and work our way back up. So dealing with the heart, how do we deal with those? Well, you remember on that three circles, we had the, the brokenness and we had those arrows and the, the cross, crossing it out. That's the process of repenting, turning away from those things. Once we have identified that we're struggling with idolizing our comfort, when we think that comfort is gonna bring us satisfaction, we repent of that. We repent of our desire for comfort by saying, God, you are enough comfort for me. You are the God of all comfort and that's what I need. We repent of the desire for human approval by saying, God, I know that your approval is the only thing that matters. I don't need man's approval. I only need yours. We repent from the desire for power by trusting that God is powerful, that he is the one who is is willing and working in our hearts. We We repent of the desire for control by saying, God, I know that you're sovereign and in control of all things, and I trust you with my life. And whenever we do that, I want to encourage you to think through, like, to ask some questions. Man, if I really latch onto that and believe it, if I believe that God is the one who's in control of my life, what would that cause me to think and feel in my mind? And if my, my heart and mind were in line, how would that result in different actions up here? Maybe rather than worrying because I'm afraid that my life's out of control, I would start placing my trust in God and I would start experiencing feelings of peace And I would start expressing those in actions of of trusting in God. So that's the tool. It's pretty straightforward. It's not a silver bullet that every time you're dealing with sin, that if you just go to this, it's going to magically make all of your problems go away. But I do find it to be so helpful whenever I'm in conversations because it keeps me from just clipping off the gumballs and it helps me go to dealing with the heart issue. So here's the challenge I'd like to extend to you as we're wrapping up. Try this out this week. Think about a sin problem you've struggled with or are currently struggling with. Sit down and write it out. Work toward the root. Prayerfully ask God to transform those broken parts of your heart. And then think about what it would look like for those actions to play out in a way that trusts in God. And then whenever you have a friend come to you and say, hey, I'm dealing with this. You can say, hey, we learned this tool at church. Is it okay if, I, if we process things together and I draw this out for you? Now, just a few tips as we're finishing up. This is going to be a learning curve. You're going to grow in your ability to discern as you use this and as you invite the Holy Spirit. Uh, Also, this is better in community. James tells us that we're to confess our sins one to another and we will experience experience healing. It requires vulnerability with ourselves, with with God, with, with other people. And also, I just want to say that this is not a replacement for trained biblical counselors. As we've been talking, maybe there's something that's just been dredged up in your heart and you say, man, um, I just don't know if I can, I don't know if I can deal with that. I thank God for people who have been trained and who have a passion for helping people work through their sin struggles. And so biblical counselors are great for that. If you're struggling with something and you feel like, man, I don't know if this is going to get it for me, then come talk with one of us. We would love to help you get connected with a biblical counselor to deal, help you deal. So let me leave us with this. It's a verse from our passage that gives me so much confidence and hope as I think about dealing with my sin and the sins of other people around me. Up earlier, Jesus said, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. Jesus offered this as both a warning to not be like the Pharisees and a promise. It's a great, beautiful, amazing promise because what he's saying is that whenever we follow Jesus, we will be fully trained and we will be like him. That's great news because Jesus is the one who always generously offers forgiveness rather than condemnation. Jesus is the one who is the seeing guide, the one who doesn't have a log in his eye or even a speck in his eye so he can fully deal with our sin. Jesus is the one who gives us the spirit who transforms the roots of our heart and gives us a heart that loves him. That's great news. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for my brothers and sisters and the way you've cared for us, the way you've extended forgiveness and generosity to us. Father, we ask that today you'd help that word sink deeply into our hearts, that you transform those root issues in us. God, I ask that you'd also give us um, the boldness, the courage to address sin in our lives and to, to help our brothers and sisters deal with the sins in their lives. God, this is hard, grueling work. Sometimes it's painful and uncomfortable, but you tell us it's worth it. 
God, as we sing today, I ask that you'd help us to be in tune with your spirit, what you're doing in us. I ask that you'd lead us in repentance by your kindness, that you'd transform us to be more and more like Jesus Christ. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.